Hi everyone, my name is Neil Gavea. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at St. Joseph's College in the Brooklyn campus. And welcome to today's webinar, Holiday Budgeting and Financial Planning for 2022. Today, I'm joined by James R. Drouet Jr., who is the first Vice President and Chief Investment Officer and Corporate Secretary at Ridgewood Savings Bank, where he manages the bank's $2.2 billion investment portfolio. He also heads the Retirement Plan Services Department and Richwood Financial Services. James received his MBA and undergraduate degree in finance from CW Post Long Island University. He graduated with honors from American Bankers Association Stony Year Graduate School of Banking in 2011 and received a Warthone School Scholarship Certificate in 2013. He also serves on the board of Mercy First, a local not-for-profit that provides care for children and families in need. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right, so I'm going to get my screen up. Okay, Neil, how does that look? It's great. We're good to go. Great, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for your time today, Neil. Thanks again. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, covered a few things that I do here at the bank. So, wanted to start here. So, holiday budgeting, financial planning for the new year. So, as of many of us have learned in college, you're not supposed to read off of your PowerPoint slides. But as we start here, there's there's a, many things to consider when we when we talk about budgeting, uh, and you're going to hear that quite often today. You're going to hear um, sales. You're going to hear tools and other things like that. But let's let's get into the first slide and we'll, we'll start with the holiday budgeting. So I'll start off with, and this is you know one, one of the harder things to, to do uh, when it comes to the budgeting for the holidays and that that's actually making a list. And you know it's um, a little bit of a play off of, of here and saying checking it twice. And you know what I mean by that is that that's something that we have to constantly be on top of. And we have to start with writing down the name of the, the people that we're gonna be purchasing gifts for during the holiday season. And this time of year, I think more than previous years, you know, writing down how much it's going to, we're going to spend on each individual. And the reason I say that is because as many of us are aware, inflation over the last couple of months has really ticked up and the ability to actually find some certain gifts has, has become more difficult and that pushes prices higher. And then after we're done with that, we're going to want to put together what that total amount is. Now, you know, the, the, Finance 101 always tells you the easiest way to budget something is not to spend more than you budget for, but that's sometimes is not a diff, it's, it's actually a difficult task. You know, we do have a lot of different folks that we want to, you know, take care of during the holidays. And we also have other things that we need to uh, pay for during the holiday season that we don't think of during, you know, throughout the year. So the next thing I, I'd speak to is, is shopping for those bargains, you know, look for sales, getting yourself together for the times when, when they come, you know, for sales for certain, uh, certain parts of the season. And sometimes it's not really a bad idea to think about that electronics gift from last year, you know, that gift. But at, at the same point, we can, um, you know, save a few dollars. We can actually fulfill a gift that we think is best for the person we're trying to purchase that electronics gift for. And generally those people are gonna be happy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that when, when we look back at those different technology that changes and how often and quickly it changes, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a terrible thing. Although, for example, like an iPad, right? If you purchase an iPad for somebody very special in your life because that's a nice purchase, you know, last year's iPad overall isn't tremendously different from this year's iPad. So it's not, not a bad idea to consider that and you'll we'll actually get a very good deal on, on a purchase like that. Also, we want to track our purchases. You know, this, this is, you know, it's a, a, in some of the slides you'll see here, I say write things down, but, you know, obviously that's just a general term to say, keep track of things. You know, we'll use our technology, we'll use our computers, we'll use our phones to keep track of, of the things that we're going to purchase. Only buy for the ones on your list. That's, that's, you know, it's very important. And sometimes it's hard to do. And I'll use some of my experiences here that, that I've actually, you know, gone through in purchases in the past and or some you know, other experiences I've had with different family members and friends. And you know, there, there are times when you'll go somewhere and there's uh, maybe people at a, a gathering that you didn't know were gonna be there and they come with a gift for you and you didn't have a gift for them. And 
those are the times sometimes we feel obligated to say, all right, well, I'm, I'll get you that gift and, you know, maybe a little awkward situation. But, you know, sometimes we have to really look at our budget and see if it fits. Uh, if it doesn't fit exactly the way you want it to, you may want to look back at some of the other spending that you have on, on the folks on your list and say, well, maybe if we cut back a little bit here, we can fit in that other person that puts you maybe in that awkward situation. But these things come up, so we have to deal with them as, as we see fit. Now, the other expenses. The other expenses, that's what I was speaking to a little bit before. And, and my point being is that those other expenses come up during the holidays. You know, you may be out shopping with family and friends and you say, oh, let's go grab something to eat quick or maybe go, um, you know, have a holiday cheers at, at one of the, the local bars or uh, eateries, wherever you may go. And those are things that we have to consider because those that that's definitely part of the holiday season for most of us. And when you go shopping, if it's not that that holiday cheer, it's, you know, running out maybe to grab a, you know, some coffee at your favorite coffee place. And sometimes those coffee drinks, as we know, can end up to be a big part, part of the meal. And, you know, think about when you do buy these gifts, you know, me personally, one of my experiences when I do go purchase gifts, I'll actually look at a place where they're, where I, I make my purchase and see if there's somewhere where they can actually wrap that gift for me, hopefully for free, if not for a nominal fee, it helps me as, as we all know, time is money. And we all are very busy in our lives, doing much, you know, Neil and I were just discussing before some of the traffic situations we have to deal with at times. And this time of year, those things can slow you down. So if you can take that um, that one gift and have somebody wrap it for an extra dollar, or maybe sometimes they they ask for a donation to wrap the gift, it's it's not it's not a bad thing to to consider because it will save you on the postage or wrapping or you know buying that those greeting cards and the you know, other things that I have listed here for you too. Now, well, one thing to talk about credit cards during the holiday. So that this is um, a difficult point to to make because. There are times where we are in situations where we might have that cash handy and we say, look, we can purchase this particular gift. They're on the list. We budgeted for it. You know, let's throw it on the credit card, get the charge done, and we can move on at this particular point. Maybe you just didn't have the cash on you or there's no ATM around or, you know, the ATM fee is just too much. I don't like that as a banker. It does, it does bother me. So what you need to do is make sure if you do use that card, make sure that charge that you're going to do or you or make for that particular purchase that you pay in full and don't miss the payment, right? This will alleviate any interest charges that may come up if, if you leave that charge on there over the, the month's end. And we don't wanna miss that payment either, right? Because that, that could be even more detrimental. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But, you know, for example, if you put, you know, if you put $1,000 on your card for a, for a purchase, you know, it, it could end up, you know, at the end of the, the, the process could end up costing you, you know, an extra, you know, it can cost you 1900 or 1500 depending on the interest rate that particular car charges. So important to keep an eye on those things, especially when we're thinking about, as I said earlier, you're going to hear it a lot, the word budget. So a few tips for saving during the holiday season. So mentioned again, as I said before, we're going to hear this a few times, and this is not a typo. I put sales, coupons, sales, sales, right? So you know, there, there are sales that you find before the holiday season starts, you know, do some research before you get deep into the season. You know, if you if you think of a gift today and you go out and you start doing some research online as to where that, that discount may be, it may be more difficult to find. Whereas if you look maybe a month ago, you, you'd be a little bit more prepared and maybe have a code or something that you can input when you do a purchase. Um, if you can purchase most of your gifts online, and I say, if you can, and, you know, there's, there's a little bit more of a story behind that Neil and I were discussing before, you know, my wife and I, when we do our purchases, you know, we've done for many years, most of it online, and we've saved a good amount of money by, you know, putting all of those purchases in one time so the delivery fees aren't as much. There's also great deals, there's ways to compare and contrast prices online. And the old, you know, the old uh, Amazon is, is, is great to look at and it gives you a lot of um, ideas when you when you go through and you look at different purchases. But I do have to say, the point I was gonna make is that this year, you know, my wife and I were a little concerned about some of the delays and some of the deliveries. You know, for example, I have three kids and we we're purchasing some Halloween items and we did get a few of them, but a few of them didn't arrive and they still haven't arrived. So that makes you kind of nervous when you go online to order something and, you know, especially the 14th of December, but even if it was a month ago, if you ordered something online and you wanted it to come in for, you know, for the holiday time, and it's important gift for something, somebody that's important to you, you know, it's, um, it can get a little bit trying 
when you don't have that gift and then you have to go to the printer, make a, a picture of the gift and then put the picture inside the box and then give them that and say, sorry, it didn't come yet. So, you know, just make sure that uh, if you're gonna order this stuff online, make sure you allow uh, plenty of time. And if it's something that you think you can actually get out there, maybe run and pick up, I would recommend just because of some of the shortages, you know, to, to go out and do that instead of ordering it online at this point. And sometimes you don't really get the great deal for everything online, but most stuff you get a, you get a really good, good discount on. The other thing is uh, do, do it yourself, a, a DIY project. You know, this is something that I've done a few times. My wife and I have worked on a few projects together for some of our family. And it's, it's something that you really do get, you know, a great reaction from, from the folks when you give them something that you actually, you know, made yourself. And even if it's a gift basket or if it's something that you prepared or it's a wreath or maybe something that, that you like to do as far as, far as maybe a, you know, a, uh, a hobby that you have to, to put some, some things together. People really appreciate that. And it saves money, more importantly, right? And then the other thing that, that I've, I found that, that works out pretty good too is that gift experience. A lot of times the gift experience can be less expensive than buying that gift. One of the examples I use here is uh, the cooking set, right? So, I mean, you can look at some cooking sets can be extremely expensive. For somebody that you know is, is really into cooking and, and loves doing that as as a, as a hobby or you know in my particular case i like to cook as well but maybe instead of getting that those that cooking set this year maybe you get them the cooking lessons and that can be most of the time less expensive and can be a great experience for them instead of uh, popping open that gift they get to go out a few times and, and learn how to make a few different meals and start saving early you know it's it's easier said than done but extremely important you know, it's, it started at the beginning of the year. I mean, as soon as you get through the holiday season, your New Year's resolution, you know, you're going to have a list of New Year's resolutions. And, you know, one of mine is going to be, you know, get back in the gym. But what you want to make sure you do is, is get that, that money saved, you know, put, start putting some money away and make a plan. It's, it's extremely important. Look back at last year's budget. The last year's budget will give you a great idea as to where you need to be going into the new year. Things change all the time, but that would be a great foundation and a great start. So went over a few things there. I don't know if anybody has any questions, um, but I will continue to move on. So the new year, it's upon us. It's come very quickly. And as we get through the uh, holiday season here, we're going we're gonna to blink and it's going to be January 1st. So what are, what are some of the things I recommend for the new year? And you know, here I may have put it out of order on purpose. So long-term goals, but don't forget the small realistic goals, right? And I say I may have put it out, on, you know, out of order on purpose, because in my opinion, you know, I think you have to think of those long-term goals first. Some would, you know, may argue the fact that, well, you have to get those realistic goals done to get first before you get to the long-term. But what I mean by long-term goals, depending on your situation, maybe it's to, you know, maybe purchase a house in the, in the future. Maybe it's to buy that new car. Um, but if you put those long-term goals out there, they're out there, they're achievable, and you can work towards that and think about the other small realistic goals that you can put in front of you that you can accomplish. And when you accomplish those goals, you have a feeling of, of you know, finishing off what your goal was for the, those realistic goals. And then you can move on and continue to think about what that long-term goal is. The long-term goals are, are very important in my opinion in life, not only for finance, but other things that, that go on. Again, the word budgeting, right? So budgeting. We have to do what's what we can. And I'm, one, one of my slides at the end, you'll see, it uh, kind of brings it all together. But you know, creating a, creating a budget, and we'll, we'll look at some tools that help you with this too. It's, it's the hardest part about creating a budget is actually starting it. You know, it's, it's, diff it's a lot easier to sit there and say, well, I, you know, I could think about it. You know, when it happens, I'll keep my receipts and I'll track it. But if you don't create that budget before you start doing that, you're never going to create the budget and you're likely going to go over or beyond your budget by the time you get into the middle of the end of the year. During the year, differentiate between your needs and your wants. This is uh, also a very difficult thing to do. And another thing that's easier said than done. You know, we, we want to make sure that when we're putting money away and we're getting ready for that new year, that we think about for the year where we really want to be as far as where our long term goals are and our realistic goals, our small realistic goals are. And when you think about those things, you'll see how quickly you'll see the needs and wants start to separate. Now, of course, in the morning, a lot of us may say, well, you know, I really need that coffee. <laughs> um, most of us probably do, but 
a lot of it, um, you know, just a regular coffee in the morning is is good. You know, you don't want to get the, you know, the the dollar coffee every morning. I think that's a little bit more of a want, and that's kind of how I decipher in the morning when I make my cup of coffee. And each month, if you can go each month and look through and and find a way in in areas, and it doesn't have to be a large amount, but small amounts because over time it'll add up to a lot. If you can find ways each month and ways to reduce your spending, so. For my example, in coffee, you know, maybe you start making the coffee at home instead of going out to uh, Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, whatever you like to do. And then if you actually get someone else involved, your spouse, family member, friend, and you know, work on the budget together, work on where you want to be and set some goals together. It's, it's something I know it sounds kind of awkward, but it's something if you do that together, you can help each other stick to that budget and get to where you want to be. So repay debt. I, you know, I said before the credit cards, you know, the credit cards, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult because it's so easy to swipe the card, go on to the next door, swipe the card again. And then after a while, you don't realize you start to you know, lose track of what you're actually putting on your card. And if you start to fall behind or for some reason that you default, then you get to the point where it really is detrimental to your credit score. And overall, over a long period of time, it's really going to cost you quite a bit of money. So make sure when you're using those cards, if you use them, Make sure you keep on top of them. Of course, you know, Ridgewood Savings Bank, where I work, we have debit cards, which, you know, work really well because those, the monies, when you actually swipe that card, will come directly out of your account. Uh, there's no month to pay it back and a lot easier to track and keep your budget on, on point. So savings, it's, you know, for the new year, we, you know, what rule of thumb, and it's different for everybody, but this is just a basic rule of thumb. It all depends on, on your situation. But if you could put 15% of your income into savings, that's just that that's just a great, you know, a great start. And it's it's a way to get to you to your goals and get to where you need to be by the end of the year. And that's part of the that goals-based approach. If you start to put money away, you start to make, you know, set your long-term and your uh, achievable short-term goals, that gets you to, you know, where you need to be and being consistent is extremely important. Extremely important. So the last thing I have bullet on here is, is create a, an emergency fund, right? So I know it sounds kind of scary, but basically what I mean by that is just to say, have some money on the side for that, that just in case, right? If, you know, if you, you have a car, you're driving your car, you know, I would say the emergency fund isn't for, you know, putting a new set of brakes on your car, right? Because that's wear and tear. We should know that that's about what that's going to cost us on an annual basis. But, you know, if the muffler falls off your car or you hit a pothole, good old New York, if you hit a pothole and you break a rim or you pop a tire or whatever it is, you know, that those are expenses that you most likely don't budget for. And then you want to have some money in that emergency fund. And that emergency fund in times like we are in now over the last year with inflation, with things costing us more money, with gasoline prices going up, you know, we can use some of that emergency fund to, to help offset some of those expenses that we may not have budgeted for in the beginning of the year. Begin investing. So this is something I will have with full disclosure. These are just some ideas and some thoughts uh, to get you where you need to be. We work hard for our money, so we want to make sure our money works hard for us. So as you put some of that money away and you have some disposable income, a great idea is to put that money to work in investments. Because if you put it in a savings account, you will earn a you know, certain amount. For example, here at Ridgewood, we pay 0.35% on savings not a, a large amount, but that's really based on market conditions. However, there are other investment options out there for you that you can consider. But when you consider those options, you have to think about your risk profile. So what I mean by risk profile is, you know, when we look at stocks, for example, so buying stock in a, in a company that we, you know, that we may know of or do research on and we talk to somebody about or talk to an investment uh, consultant about, is that if we put money into a stock, for example, let's say we chose, and this is not a recommendation, but if we chose Apple, for example, for a stock to, to purchase, you have to put money into a stock thinking that there's a probability that every penny you put in, you can lose. However, there are there is that risk profile that we're thinking about. If the stock goes up 10%, 15%, that's the other side. If you take on that risk, there's a higher probability that you'll get better returns. Now, if your risk profile is a little bit less than that, for example, for me, I, my risk profile would be less. I wouldn't invest directly in individual stocks personally, different when I manage the portfolio here at the bank. But there's other options out there like corporate bonds. And corporate bonds, basically what you're doing is you're 
uh, lending a corporation uh, portion of usually at the, the minimum amount that you can do is a thousand dollars. And what you're doing is you're lending that corporation money. They're going to pay you a certain return over a specific period of time. And at the end, you'd get your principal back as long as that company is still in business. So for example, a corporate bond, I, I, I can think of uh, recently that, you know, um, that, that I saw on my Bloomberg terminal was a JP Morgan Chase bond. Again, it's not a recommendation, but a JP Morgan Chase bond, it was a five-year final, so five-year maturity. It was offering a 2% interest rate return. So that's 2% annually, or some of you get semi-annual, but 2% when you run the calculation, 2% for the year. And then at the end of five years, you'd get your investment back. As I said before, let's say it was a thousand. So over that time frame, you'd get every every year you'd get um, that two percent return on on the thousand dollars, two hundred dollars, and over five years you'd get your principal back. And there is some risk in that because if, if rates go higher and you have that bond for five years, then you're going to be below market uh, rates at that point. However, it's definitely a consideration when you're thinking about potentially putting your money in in a uh, savings account at 0.35%, right? Definitely a benefit there. As far as stocks go, if you if you prefer to take a lower risk, there's the option of mutual funds. There's index mutual funds as an option. Now that allows, that allows lower risk because in mutual funds, you'll have a pool of stocks. For example, let's say an S&P 500 mutual fund will have 500 different stocks within this one mutual fund that you would be purchasing shares in. And the probability of that going to zero is, is extremely low. However, based on your point of entrance and the point of sale, that's when you would have to figure out what your market value is and if you, get, you have a gain there or if you have a loss. And then there's other options out there like exchange traded funds, which is basically um, very similar to mutual funds. However, it's something that you can trade on a daily basis where mutual funds trade uh, on a net asset value, which is calculated at the end of each trading day. You can't trade it throughout the day on mutual funds. 401k, that's, you know, that, that's an option. I think we all know what 401ks are. I don't want to get too far into the details on that, I'm getting close to my time here. And then you have your, your IRAs. Now, I put up, up on the screen here, Ridgewood Financial Services. Obviously, here at the bank, we offer, we offer services where you can sit down with a consultant and actually tell them what your goals are financially. And they'll work with you and put a plan together for you to, to achieve those goals. And then there's other options out there like Robinhood and Interactive Brokers. Those are, are quite different. Now, you know, those are things you're going to have to do your own research for if you want to purchase, you know, stocks, cryptocurrency, whatever it is. Some of them do offer some, you know, some uh, educational material. However, when it comes down to the point where you're actually going to do that transaction, that's based on your decision and how you have done your research and where you think and how you can achieve your goals. So different options, a consultative approach or an individual approach and where you can go online and, and do that yourself. So many different, many different tools out there available, but you know, investing is, is very important when it comes down to growing wealth over time. And there's different ways to get there. So I encourage everyone to do that, but make sure you do your research, make sure you get out there and don't jump on the, the train when everyone is, is, is heading the same way. Sometimes it's good to think about maybe looking at a, at a different option. I'm not saying that's always the case, but a lot of times it is. What I like to do here, I know it looks like a blank screen, but I want to show you one of the tools that Ridgewood has available. It's a short video, just over a minute. I just want to play this for you quickly. And this gives you an idea of some of the tools that, that Ridgewood offers to actually help you with your budgeting. We get it. Managing your financial life can be kind of a pain. For example, just to check your balances, you have to log into a bunch of different sites. A checking account over here, mortgage over there, not to mention all the credit cards. It's overwhelming, right? Who's got time for that? Wouldn't it be nice if you could log into just one place and check all of your account balances? Well, now you can. Our online banking has been enhanced. It pulls in and organizes financial info from all your different financial accounts into one place, securely inside online banking. Now you can check just one place and see all your accounts together. Pretty cool, huh? So log into online banking now and start simplifying your financial life.
So that tool that we have available here at Ridgewood, it's called uh, Money Management MX. So this is a tool, it's great. I actually use it. I linked all the different accounts that I have, so you know, credit cards and mortgage and other things. You can link it all together, and it allows you to manage it in, in a very you know simple way. And you get to create your your different buckets and the different areas and you know that you um that you spend money in maybe a little bit more in, than than others do. And once it's all created, as the spending happens, it tracks it. And it's, it's a place that it can give you a little alarms. You can go in and check, make sure you're on budget. And if you're off in a certain, uh, you know, a certain area where you're maybe spending a little bit more, maybe spending, you spent a little bit more going out to eat, then you can see in other areas where you can actually offset some of that other expense. So a very helpful tool. There are other tools out there available to you too. You know, one of, one of the ones I looked up to is Capital One Shopping, which is great. You know, before I spoke about sales, you know, Capital One Shopping allows you to go on and when you make purchases, it automatically will um, pull up a, a coupon or a discount for you and, and, and actually apply it without you having to do much. And then another thing is um, Rocketin. I think maybe may, may have heard of that. You actually can purchase products and you get cash rewards or you get uh, discounts on, on, on many things. So I have listed here for you the different things that money management has available to you. And, and again, just another tool, many of them out there. So please do your research and see what fits best for, for you and uh, many applications too that, that you can use. So the last thing I have for you today is, this is a quote from, uh, from Jim Rome. You know, if you really wanna do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. And this goes into what I said earlier. One of the hardest things to do when it comes to budgeting is actually starting a budget. So I recommend that you actually start that budget and don't find an excuse as to why you shouldn't. It'd be extremely helpful. And once you get that budget started, you'll, you're, you're going to appreciate it. And it's something that over time will, will be very helpful for you in the future. And Neil, that's great. Thanks so much, James. What a fantastic presentation. So much uh, insightful and useful information. Uh, this time, I'll also ask for our, uh, attendees, if you have any questions, just pop it in the chat box and I'll uh, make sure James uh, gets a uh, hold of them. Uh, James, I wanted to ask you about uh, the shopping with debit cards versus credit cards in, in the holiday season. Um, uh, is, the, is there, do you, have, do you have any suggestion in terms of like uh, where you would go on that or is it dependent on the person, what kind of person they are in terms of budgeting and, and uh, what kind of financial situation you're in? Yeah, you know, I think, I think every point you made is, is, part, of, is part of that decision-making process. So, you know, the debit cards, in, in my opinion, are useful because it's something that when you go out and you think about your budget and you're doing shopping, you know, like I said, if you don't have that ATM around the bend and you can pull out some cash to, to make a purchase. And, you know, that's actually a good point I forgot to make before. Sometimes making sure you have enough cash in your pocket and then going out only spending that cash can help you too. But the point for the debit cards, actually, you can get rewards on debit cards as well. So for example, the Ridgewood debit card, if you take out that card, we offer a rewards program where you can get gifts or cash back. And that, that can be helpful too when you're thinking about the sales and the coupons, mm -hmm. that that's, that's something that you know, over time adds up to, to be quite a bit, especially if you, you use it throughout the year. But you know, the other point is that you know, the credit cards, it's, it's, if you swipe them a few times and that bill comes you know, a few weeks later, sometimes you look at that bill and you say, oh, well, based on what my budget looks like for this month, I may not be able to pay for the whole thing. I'll pay a portion of it. And then you start paying interest where a debit card comes directly out of a checking or savings account. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions coming in. The first one's from Nicole. Is there a particular amount slash percentage you recommend we budget to spend on holiday gifts based on an individual's discretionary income? Uh, you know, that's 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 a great question. It's it's tough to answer because it is dependent upon you know many um, situations. It depends on on your, your income level, uh, depends on what how much you budgeted for, for that particular year. But I'll use this as an example. Let's say if you have a car, right? The, the rule of thumb for a car, as far as what your expenses are for the year, is you look at whatever the value of the car is. Let's say you purchased a car for $50,000, um, you know, over a loan, usually that's how it happens, right? But let's say the value of the car is 50,000, 5%, of that should be approximately what you have in there for maintenance. So it's about $2,500 per year. Now you say, well, I just bought a new car. Why would I need that much for maintenance? Well, things pop up. Sometimes your brakes or other things can, can occur. So when it comes to thinking about how much you should have 
set aside, you know, that can be anywhere, I would say, from 10 to 15 percent of, of your um, of your income for the year. Okay, 10 to 15. All right, sounds good. Another question is from uh, Kelly, and she wants to know how much do you recommend to have available in savings to keep easily accessible for emergencies uh, VS investing? First investing, yeah, you know that that's that's a very good one too. So when it comes to the amount you should have in that emergency fund, I would say if you can look at what your expenses are for a six month time frame, right? So your living expenses. So your expenses for um, you know for rent if you if you're renting or if you have a mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, food for other things that you need to get by for for those for that six month time frame. Yeah, whatever that number is, I'd say you should have that in savings for that emergency fund. Yeah, generally six months is that right? That's it. Six months, and if you want to be conservative, go for the year. Go for the year. Okay. And we have a question from Kate. She wants to know. Is it true uh, that you don't really save on Black Friday deals? And I, I read somewhere about this too as well, like what some merchants will do a couple of weeks prior, they'll do a little finagling with the pricing and then, oh, look, it's a Black Friday special, but it would, um, was it really that spectacular to begin with? Uh, you know, the research I've done, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, product dependent, but the research I've done when it comes to electronics, and like I said, you know, you know that that purchase of electronics, yeah, it's usually the last year's TV that really sells for a great price. But mm -hmm. to your point, Neil, a lot of times they'll say, all right, that let's say the TV is selling normally for six hundred dollars, right? Right before the the Black Friday, they'll they'll say, yeah, the TV was seven hundred dollars, slashed mm -hmm. down to five ninety nine, you know. Um, so I think that happens quite a bit. So. There are definitely deals out there, but be careful. And I think you you might be better off looking at Cyber Monday than, than Black Friday. All right, makes sense. Uh, so uh, James, you, you have children. Um, what if, for those who uh, for those parents out there who want to start budgeting, um, practical budgeting advice for their children? Do you there is there any tips that you uh, can recommend to them, or any that you implement with your children, or is it too soon? Uh, with yours, I'm not sure how old they are. <laughs> yeah, I can, you know, I can definitely remind my, I have three girls and, and they all are, you know, just about all three of them are in teenage years. I have one that's okay. not there yet, but you know, when, when my kids were younger, obviously a lot easier at their age to budget money for the gifts that we, that we gave them for the year. Uh, as they got older, the gifts got less in number, but more expensive. And currently with, you know, in the teenage years, they're all looking at for that, for the new phone, for the new iPad. Uh, for the new expensive pair of sneakers. So, you know, it's um, my budget, def my budgeting for that has definitely changed, comparatively speaking. Uh, but, you know, we have to keep it realistic. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's something when we look at our overall budget for the year, that's when it gives you a really good idea on how you want to budget for the holiday season. And, and just a little hint, just make sure you have a little bit more in the budget for the kids when it comes <laughs> to that time of year. Yes. <laughs> a little, <laughs> a little, a little <laughs> Extra additional information here. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, another question from uh, we have here. Do you, do you rack up some credit card debt around the holidays? What is, okay, I'm sorry, if you rack up credit card debt around the holidays, what is the best approach of paying it off? Yeah, that's, you know, that, that happens a lot. You know, as I mentioned before, we always try to do our best to not, to not put too much on the cards because the, the interest expense can really add up quickly. Uh, if, if you do it, I would say make sure you put that in your New Year's budget plan and pay it off as quickly as you can. Now, that being said, you know, I wouldn't go out and take out other loans or other types of debt to pay off that debt. And you just start to get yourself into a hole that's hard to get out of. But, you know, if you put it in your budget and you say to yourself, well, you know, I did put some, some interesting gifts on the card I wasn't expecting in the budget, but I think I, you know, based on my budget for the new year, I can pull maybe not to spend, you know, for the first three months of the year, maybe not go out to some dinners or maybe go out uh, less times during the month. And save those extra funds, put it to that card, and get it paid off within three to six months. To, you know, I would go no longer than, than six months when it comes to that. But when you do your budget, make sure you budget in what that's going to cost you, because it's going to cost you daily an interest expense. Right. Or they could just use half debit, half credit. Is another option in terms of yeah, yeah, that's great. Look, the debit card keeps you on track. You know, it's almost like it's almost like having that cash in an envelope in your pocket when you go shopping, right? If you go up to the register and and they ask you for X amount of dollars and there's nothing left in the envelope you know, usually you put that gift back and you walk away. So uh, sometimes yeah. it's better to take that tax. Leave the credit cards at home if, if, if it's hard to, you know, to, to not use them. <laughs> this is true. James, I know you want um, me specialize in retirement. Um, uh, for 
this is a little bit away from uh, the budgeting and so forth. Well, it kind of is actually, but for a single person, what's an amount, a decent amount you would say, okay, you're about to uh, retire from work and you have X amount saved, you're going to be in a good situation, good position to just relax, you know, in your golden years for a single person. And then for a couple. Yeah. You know, for a single person, it's, it comes down to what your living expenses are. And it's, it's the same for a couple as well, right? So hmm. if, you're, if you're single and you, you, know, you lived a certain life and you want to continue to live that life or potentially maybe even live a little bit more because you're now in your golden years, as you mentioned, you know, I, I would be sure that when you put money away, put money away above and beyond what your monthly and annual expenses are prior to retirement, you know, that you know that and on an annual basis, you'll, you'll get that back. Hmm. And there's many different products out there that you could consider when, when doing this. And, you know, have supplemental income, uh, additional in money in there for your retirement, because as unfortunately, as we all know, as things go forward, the, you know, we're going to be, the taxes will go higher, um, expenses will go up, and we mm -hmm. want to make sure we prepare for that, right? Because today at, at, at a younger age, we can look at it and say, well, we spend X dollars a month, but, you know, in 15, 20, 10, 15, you know, whatever years you are away from that, it, the, the picture can look a lot different. So making sure you continue to put away, even as a couple, it's, it's, I would say it's the same, same process and same approach. Since, um, another question just came in. What's the best format to keep your budget in the spreadsheet? Is there, in the spreadsheet, is there an app or some type of template that you personally use? Yeah, actually I use the, I use the MX management tool here at Ridgewood and that's, that's in our online. Mm -hmm. and so that, that allows me to have, I have my checking, my savings accounts. I have my, uh, I was able to link my mortgage. I don't have my, my mortgage here at the bank. I'm not, I'm not actually allowed to do that as an executive of the bank. I have other credit cards and it all, it all comes into one place. And then when I use my, my, um, my debit card, all of the spend in my debit card, for example, if I go out to, to grab something to eat, it's categorized right away and it goes into a portion of the MX management. Or if I go to the store to do shopping for my house or whatever it is, it's all categorized. And then you can track it in that way as well. And then there's other applications that you, know, that you can use as well. There's, there's, there's many out there if you, if you Google uh, budgeting tools, they'll, they'll, they'll pop up for you. Okay, good, good stuff. Um, you, uh, we talked about car payments, you know, being a, um, you know, an issue versus, um, an issue or an expense rather. Do you recommend um, leasing or buying or it depends on the person? I've heard many different, uh, you know, outlooks on this question. Um, I myself, I, I've always thought that for me personally, leasing always works for my um, benefit. You know, I, I, I'm kind of spoiled and like, I like having a brand new car a couple, <laughs> a couple of years, but it's an additional note you got to take care of. You know, it's an, you know, it's like a cell phone bill, you know, and other expense. But um, would you recommend leasing for someone and like uh, buying for someone, uh, uh, others when it comes to uh, cars? Yeah, sure. You know, it's, it's something and, and I happen to be, you know, um, I happen to be the opposite of how you your approach. So I actually purchase my cars and I own them. I don't lease them. Uh, but I'm not saying the way you do it is wrong in any by any means. Because when you lease a car, as you know, when you go to lease a car, your payments on a monthly basis will be less than if you actually purchase the same car. So there's a benefit there because you're not going to actually have a larger payment. But at the end of the lease, you turn in your car and you'll get another car. Uh, likely maybe similar or a little bit more, hopefully the things are going well at work and then you can get a, even a nicer car, then your payments go up and, but you'll still be in a position where it's going to be less than if you bought the car. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that after, let's say after, you know, just choose five years as, as, an, as the term, that after five years, I'll own my car. I have no more car payments and I continue to drive that car with no car payments. Whereas a lease car, you continue to move forward. Now, that being said, if you have the ability to write that lease off, if you own a business or if you, ha if you have um, an LLC and you're able to write that expense off, then I think that's the best way to go. Okay, that's interesting. So for me personally, I don't own a company. So I think in you know, my opinion and how I've done it in my experience, as I said before, I use, you know, work a lot of my different experiences. Yeah. I would, I would actually do a, a, you know, a purchase on the car. Okay. So finance it, pay it off and own it for several years and then trade it in and start over with a certified pre-owned. Okay, got it. So, yeah, my totally different elements, you know. My look is like, okay, brand new car, new toy, yay. You know? <laughs> no, no. Um, for those of us with really, with bad credit, what's like three tips you can three point like three main um tips you can give us to like really not that I have bad credit, but those who have 
bad, you know, or have an issue with credit? Is there three things you could tell them right off the bat? This is going to help you on your path to uh, increasing your credit score. Yeah, sure. You know, it's a great question. And and look, it, it happens. People, um, you know, not not by um, by purpose. They, mm -hmm. they get into a situation or things occur in their lives where things change or um, unfortunately, sometimes fraudulent things happen on people's, you know, um, credit reports. But that being said, so, you know, the best thing you can do is if you do have some debt, pay it off. If you happen to have, let's say you have three credit cards and, you know, maybe using two of them off more often than, than one of them, I would suggest canceling that one card. You know, some, some may say, well, oh, if you cancel the card, then that looks, that doesn't look good. But really to have credit outstanding and not use it is, is actually detrimental to your credit most of the time. So I'd recommend doing that. And, you know, there's, there's different um, ways to, to get help uh, for, um, you know, for maybe some other debts you might have to, to get you to where, you, you know, your credit score will improve over time. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I had to give myself a little pat in the back because I, I just got one over the 800 mark this year. Oh, for congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So, That's a big feat. Yeah, totally. It was like, because I think I was back in the day, I think what, the, what was that? It was, now it's 850 is the highest score. And I think before, was it was it 799 or 800 back in there? I think it was 800. It depends on the, the agency, but yeah, it's 750, 800, 850. Yeah, okay. Got it. That's right. So I'm pretty proud of myself. I got to, you know, reach that little, you know, mark in life. Uh, we have another question. How do you save up for your first home when you rent on Long Island, when, when rent on Long Island is so high? Yeah, well, that, that, that's a tough one. Look, um, in, in my opinion, it's and there's many different opinions on this, but when it comes down to renting or buying, you know, purchasing a home isn't always the best route to take. But to get to the point of the question, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, is, it is a difficult thing to do because you have to dig really deep in that budget and look at your income and say, where are places I can start to put some money away yeah. and save money? Or if you have a, you know, some additional income, put it into investments. And over time, build that nest egg, if you will. And we get to the point where you could say, all right, well, I'm at the point where I have a down payment. I can get, you know, my credit looks good. Yeah. And I can start to look for a home so you don't have to pay someone else's rent or pay someone else's mortgage if you're renting, um, you know, from someone's house or, you know, a commercial property. Or if they're like a single person, you know, they could just decide to like have a roommate or rent out a room. And Yeah, and yeah, that's a great idea. It's a great idea, you know. Suck it up, you know, if we like our independence, but you know, like you could, if you could save an extra 700 bucks a month by, you know, renting out a room or having a roommate, then that's your yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe don't lease that car, maybe, you know, buy instead. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, for a home, um, is it the minimum to put down is 2%, right? Is that, is it the minimum, but it's not recommended? Um, uh, the 20%. 20%, where did I get this 2% from? Yeah. Um, there are, is 20% the recommended and then um, the minimum is like five to 10? Yeah, so, so on most uh, mortgages, the, the rule of thumb for most banks and most lending institutions is they much prefer to see you put down 20% on the home. Okay. Um, you can, there are loans out there, FHA, VA loans that you can actually get depending on how much the loan, is, it, how much the loan amount is that you can actually put down a minimum of five percent, but then you're going to have to pay um, a mortgage insurance until you get to that twenty percent mark. So it does cost you a little bit more to do that if you don't put down the full twenty percent. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah, it's a uh, things just it just gets higher and higher, right? That's just how the the, the cycle is. <laughs> yeah, and home prices keep going up and up. You know, we'll, we'll see how that continues for the future. But it's it's been especially on Long Island as as the question asked before. Yeah. So those numbers continue higher. So yeah. it's tough. Yeah, it is tough times and but we got to hang in there. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to see if there's any, anyone else has any other questions for today's webinar. Um, James, what I can also do is pass off your information to, to the attendees. And if they have any, um, if they're interested in any of the services you provide to as well, um, they're able to reach out to you directly as well. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that wraps it up. Uh, James, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. A lot of great information today. Uh, I know uh, I learned a lot, and I'm pretty sure everyone who joined too as well, uh, did as well. And um, we'll be in touch. And uh, happy, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and wishing you all the best in 2022. Same to you and everyone else on the call. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. Okay, everyone, take care. All right. Thanks. See you.